everyone. I'm talking with you directly from the home of Tal and Andrea Golan in Costa Mesa, California. I actually arrived this morning by train from LA, where I was for a week after arriving from Venice. So a lot of travels. And I was mentioning to Sofia just before all of you came online how excited I am to share with you uh, really this crazy, crazy, crazy adventure. And I was going through the Venice Biennale or biannual in English um, with kind of CSP eyes, uh, looking at the gems I can collect for you and how to kind of share this crazy event uh, with all of you. I will say just before I start sharing the screen and, and you know, uh, so that you guys see all the images together with me, I will say this was my first time in the Venice Biennale. So even though, because as an art professional, I've been hearing about it and seeing images um, for the past uh, 15, 20 years, um, this was actually the first time I got to go, also thanks to uh, CSP. Um, and I feel it's really special to share it because, and this is something I've been uh, hearing also from a lot of friends, this first time of encountering the immensity of this event, it's almost mind blowing. Uh, and that's why like I am, I don't remember myself being as excited about uh, a session as I am right now, almost in fear of, am I able to like transmit uh, this craziness to you? Hopefully I am. And uh, our, our talk today, our time today, I'm just gonna share the screen and we're gonna dive right in. Um, up, yeah. Uh, so The Milk of Dreams uh, is the title of the 59th Venice uh, Biennale. Um, and before we dive into it, I do want to look a tiny bit about the history and how it's related to Venice and why like me deciding to look to use this event in a way to also open up world events and a reflection of what's going on in our world isn't my invention. Like it, it makes sense. It's inherently part of the uh, Biennale. And we're looking here at the image of Ricardo Selvatico. He was a playwright, poet, and politician who was the mayor of Venice. Look how beautiful that is. One day, maybe we once again will have uh, our politicians be playwrights and poets. Uh, and he came up with the idea of the Venice uh, Biennale to have an art exhibition that happens, that gathers together uh, the world in a very large international way that puts Italy on the map, but also brings the world together. We're seeing here an image of a, of the Rialto Bridge. It's still there. I actually took uh, uh, pictures of the sunrise from this bridge just uh, two weeks ago. Um, and in terms of this coming from Venice, it's not a very surprising thing. Venice, in many ways, is the birthplace of capitalism the way we know it today. Uh, the, where they were situated with the sea, the trades they had, the fact that it was a city-state, um, brought diplomacy on very, very early on. And also, actually, um, Venice is kind of the where banks were invented. Um, and all of this brought together this idea of dealing in terms of not only uh, financial and commercial ways with the world, but actually bringing the world together also uh, through art. Um, the decision was made and the Biennale was inaugurated in 1895. That's how early it uh, started uh, at the, and the king and queen were there for the inauguration. We're looking here at the first uh, art pavilion and even an etching, a colored etching of the inauguration that was uh, in the newspaper a few, a few years later. It brought like the, the numbers were huge. 240,000 people were at the inauguration and it was this huge uh, event and very, very successful. Uh, you can see here uh, the picture of what started out as the Italian pavilion. We're going to see it shifted uh, and became the central uh, pavilion uh, at that point. And from uh, 1907, we start to have other uh, nations coming in. So at first, uh, the biennial was by invitation only, mainly Italian artists and other internationals. And it slowly grew um, 
inviting other nationalities to participate, building their own pavilions in the first place, the Jardini, which we're going to see in a moment, the Jardini, the gardens, that's where uh, it started. And actually, Belgium was the first uh, national pavilion to, to have a space uh, in the Jardini, and this grew and grew. Um, Again, you're going to see how this picture, we're going to see it in real life uh, in a few slides time. With the years, you see here that other um, uh, forms of art were added to the Biennale, music, cinema, and theater. And then in the 1980s, also the architecture Biennale, and two very unique things happened with that. First of all, to the main area, the Jardini, the gardens, where we have all the national pavilions, was added the Arsenale Corderie. This is the area where once the ships of the Venetians were built. And because they wanted to keep their secrets so well, you can see they're built within this very enclosed space. Uh, so that in no way anyone coming from seas or around couldn't see how they were built. And this whole area in the 1980s was converted to be the second venue of, uh, um, of the Biennale, that's the Arsenale, and very exciting, especially for architects to have it in an area where the architecture itself was so unique. So at this point, we have the Biennale is happening in two central locations. One are the gardens, the other the Arsenale. In both places, we have a central exhibition, we'll talk about that in a moment, and the national pavilions. Uh, and there are also collateral events that happen throughout the city sponsored and endorsed by the Biennale. Um, we have here, as you can see, the Biennale Danza, the dance uh, that was added in 99. So basically all the uh, forms of arts take part of this. And in, especially in the Giardini and Arsenale, Arsenale, you have one year the art biennial and the other year the architecture biennial. Each are open for six months and in between they switch and kind of uh, build those exhibitions. So these places are actually functioning all the time in quite an extreme uh, way. So here are already uh, photos uh, from uh, just now, this is uh, uh, literally two weeks ago, uh, the entrance to the gardens, to the Giardini. I will say um, I played with photos I took and photos I took off, uh, online just so you have uh, the clearest images of them all. But you can see from the kind of walking here along the pier and then turning to the left to the entrance, you can see the symbol of the Milk of Dreams, this year's exhibition, which we'll talk about in a moment. So a very large, impressive uh, entrance. And you can see here far back, if you remember the building I showed you at first, it's that building. And you can see here what started is the Italian pavilion has since moved. And this is the main entrance. You can see here La Biennale, the, the entrance to the main exhibition. So each year there's a curator chosen to be the curator of the Biennale. They choose a theme. And this theme is the center, kind of uh, what holds together the central exhibitions that will happen in the Giardini in this building, in the Arsenale, it's in their central building. All the pavilions around are um, depending on the nationalities. So each nation has a pavilion. Uh, we, I will say we're going to talk tomorrow more about the nation pavilions and how they're structured and then just before diving into the American uh, pavilion, but they each have their own decision of who the curator is, who the artist is, and what they're going to exhibit, but they do know the theme. So the theme runs through not only the main uh, exhibition, but also through the pavilions. It kind of resonates uh, in them. So this year's uh, um, curator is Cecilia Alemani. Uh, you can see here a few of uh, the details. She's an Italian curator based in New York City. Some of you might have heard of her. Uh, she's the curator of the Highline 
uh, in New York. She's the fifth woman to ever curate the uh, Venice Biennale and the first Italian woman to do so. So that's a tall order. Uh, and she took that, you know, it's, it's quite a thing to be the first Italian woman to curate the, the Venice uh, Biennale. Um, and she picked picks the title. She was appointed in 2018. The, the Venice Biennale was supposed to open in 2020. Um, but as all of us know, the world, sorry, in 2021, but the world closed down uh, and it was postponed uh, to 2022, to this year when it opened in April. So basically, even though she had the concept, she started working on something that was supposed to happen in a certain world and found herself working on the Biennale in a world completely changed by the pandemic. And if you think of it also, uh, the war in Ukraine entered the mix at some point. And all of these have a great effect, even though she actually starts with a point of view uh, that is very much um, fitting to our world these days. And she takes the title from uh, a book by Leonora Carrington, uh, who's a British born and then later in her life lived in Mexico, um, female painter and author. And this book is actually written originally in Spanish, translated in 2017 to English and then published for the first time in 2017. It's actually a book of a children's story that she was telling to her two younger children with crazy, beautiful watercolor illustrations. And it's really about a fantastical world. And in this way, Cecilia Alemani decides to create a Biennale uh, that touches on how we see our world uh, past and future, uh, way beyond, um, I'd say, the, the technicalities of it and leaning into surrealism. Now, if we think of surrealism, a form of art that was born between the world wars, that was looking at the world suddenly, you know, very hard to make sense of what was going on in the world, plus all the industrial change. Uh, and surrealism looks to touch on reality and kind of going beyond, right? Surrealism, going beyond reality into the worlds of subconscious, of uh, fantasy and all. And in the world we're in, Cecilia Alemani decides to create a biennial that looks in both directions. She looks back uh, wanting to take a, another look at history, who was writing history, uh, what can it tell us about where we are today, and looking in the future and how are we able to look at our world in a different way. And I think it's very, very fitting. I think we can all agree that we're in a time of great transition. Um, where so much in the world is changing around us and we still don't know what the future will look like. Another thing you can notice the moment, you know, we're thinking of the milk of dreams, she's taking us kind of outside of reality. That's one, right? Like a dream. And also with the words, the milk, she's also putting us in, a, in the realm of the feminine, okay? And those two things are very, very um, prominent in these exhibitions. Um, what I'm going to do with you now, we're going to go and look at a few things in the Giardini and the central exhibitions there before we actually move to the Arsenale, because I felt that the central exhibition in the Arsenale was actually uh, way more powerful to me than the one in the Giardini. So um, I'll say this, there is so much to see. It's so overwhelming that the fact that you have someone to pick and choose the highlights is really um, a good thing, because otherwise it's it becomes comes really, really crazy. You can see one of the works here by Leona uh, Carrington, and you can see how fantastic like it is, right? This woman with electrified hair standing up, the very long neck holding this blue bird looks in a complete kind of uh, dream world or land in a beautiful, uh, just also a very beautiful uh, image. So, this is the entrance hall to the Giardini, and I just want you to see the scale, okay? Um, you can see the person here, so you can understand the scale of this. So you enter this magnificent hall, and you're staring, like, literally head up at this uh, 
real life size uh, elephant, really uh, kind of crazy. You can see uh, the name of the artist here, Katharina Fritsch, um, and the, the artwork is from 1987. So an important thing to notice is that the Biennale uh, doesn't have only artists that are making work now. It kind of captures works under the themes going past and present. And actually, compared to previous years, this year, uh, the split of ages within the Biennale is very interesting. There are either a lot of much older artists and much younger artists, far less middle range. It's also the first Biennale where we have a majority of women artists or uh, uh, non-gender confirming artists. And this is the first time that we have, we have that. This, this elephant uh, by Kath Katharina Fritsch from 1987 is uh, created with molding over um, a stuffed elephant. So it gets all the very, very, um, I'll show you here another image. You can see when you're looking at it, it looks very, very real. It is painted in a gray that is almost dark green. So it puts it a little bit outside of the realism and into kind of this in-between uh, space in this beautiful entrance hall. And then the moment you enter, especially confronting such a huge animal, you feel kind of a little bit smaller and question this relationship between the human and the wildlife. There's another little element about this sculpture in the entrance of the uh, Giardini exhibition, since uh, in the gardens, in the Giardini, uh, just before uh, the inauguration of the first uh, Biennale in the uh, 1890s, there was actually an elephant named Tony living in those gardens. He was referred to as the prisoner in the Giardini. So this uh, elephant also touches on a very specific local history, which I think is interesting to understand that possibly that is only uh, happening because the curator is Italian and the history kind of runs uh, very, very deep. So that is the entrance. This is the one, uh, one of the uh, parts and Again, this is here almost only for size at first, just so we understand uh, how large the space is. This is just one of the many halls of the central uh, exhibition. So you walk in, it's this huge work. Marinalini, uh, uh, okay, maybe a, a short disclosure here. So many of the artists' names, I cannot for the life of me pronounced because they come from so many different places in the world. So I know they're spelt correctly because I can copy that, but I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. And I'd say that's okay. I, I think it's a beautiful thing to encounter the fact that there's so many names I don't know in what I'm seeing and experiencing. This artist from uh, Mumbai or Bombay, it, it's actually uh, this artwork, we're not going to dive uh, into it uh, so much. I more wanted uh, these images for you to see the size. And if you look here, there's a tiny painting hidden by this woman. And we're going to go to the next slide and see that painting. And this painting is actually uh, the basis of all the um, um, graphics for the Venice Biennial. I can show you over here. Okay, you can see the, uh, this is the little catalog and you can see that the image comes from this uh, painting by this uh, artist from Chile. Um, and Cecilia Vicuna, uh, in this painting, she touches on kind of the migration leaving Chile because of the wars there um, and kind of the different family scenes and the missing of them, the kind of what, what the guitar, what the tune holds and very fitting to, I'd say, complete the title of this Biennale, talking a lot migration about how we see the world and so many of the artists will see also in where they started their lives and where they're living or where they ended their lives is very often different uh, to one another. So we're, we're kind of going in and out for a moment and here you see this is the Arsenale um, and if you remember the little image that I showed you, I'm 
did I put it here? Yes, I did. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so you can see here, this is the, you can see the corridor. You can see these two uh, towers over here with the bridge over them. And this is basically them. So I was walking over this and this is the image. And then the Arsenale is happening all over here. The next image, you're actually going to see this and the entrance over here. So just so you see, which I think it's stunning to walk in the city where you can see physically how you're walking and what was painted in the 1200, which is kind of, to me, mind blowing. So you can see this is walking across the canal, right along, sorry, along the canal. This is kind of how it's fortress and then taking a left into here. And this is already kind of along there. So just so you see that again, because I think it's pretty stunning. Okay, so that picture is here, taking a left over here, and then walking in here towards the entrance of the Biennale where everything will take place uh, in here. Okay, so yeah, it's really, I think, walking through an old city and seeing this art happen in a place where uh, it's all so ancient. And this is a very short video. I just wanted you to get an understanding of the scale and what it is to walk in. So this is just a few seconds for you to see. Okay, so that's the entrance hall. So you kind of go across this uh, this sign into the hall. It's huge, and there are many, many. Oh, one moment. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the next slide. There are many, many people here. I must say, I was very proud of myself to manage to get one photo without people, because that's a very, uh, <laughs> it's a very tricky thing when there's so many people. You can see though the scale. I'm not going to talk a lot about this work because this is a uh, the central work by Simone Lee, the American uh, artist, and we're going to talk about her uh, more tomorrow. But I did want you to get a sense of a scale, and you. Can can see their paintings they're not actually paintings I'll explain them in a moment on the wall and I want us to talk about them they're around and I must say when I entered I knew that sculpture by Simon Lee because I saw it on the high line a few years ago but these works were like they they took me by surprise I'm gonna say a few words about them and I took some close-ups for you so that you can get kind of the feeling because actually they're extremely, the material is very present. So these are works by uh, artist Belki Sayon. You can see she's a Cuban artist, a very short life, right? 67 to 99. Um, and these stunning works that touch, as you can see here, um, on, she kind of takes from all the pool of religions and mythologies, um, uh, demons and creatures and angels and gods to create a story of human life and people coming together mainly around life and death. And I think in this image, it's easiest to see because you can see the human figure here laying dead and the family coming around. And if you look, you can see quite a few different um, uh, symbols coming into these very, very large works. They're not paintings, they're collagraphs. I'll explain in a moment what that is. But it means when you're walking into that entrance hall, one of the things that comes uh, across very, very clearly is that you're surrounded by not only the large sculpture of Simon Lee, but also these works in black and white, um, beautiful works, beautiful figures that are coming, uh, coming together that you can't necessarily place in a certain nation or country or geography, um, but kind of give you the feeling that you just want to dive into them more and more. You can see here uh, a little more. And before I uh, go to, this is a close-up, but I wanted you to see this because I think it also alludes to something uh, important that we'll talk more about today, but we'll come in a little bit today. Uh, sorry, more about tomorrow and comes in a little bit today. These works that were created by the artist actually when she finished school, so very early on, uh, belong to the collection of the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. So, and you can see here what's written, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, it was impossible to show the original work here. 
So it's really interesting, first of all, that in the first hole we entrance, uh, we enter, we're seeing not only the art, but we're seeing the effect of what's going on in the world right now. So these specifically uh, were shown just as printed images. The other works could arrive and they were originals. And I wanted you to see some of them from up close. So this isn't a full image. It's me going really, really close and taking photos for you. And you can see the texture over here. Now, what is a collagraph and how is it made? Here, you can see here the, the full image of this and a close-up of it. A collagraph is a type of printing method where on a plate, you place uh, not only the, the color to then put through um, the printmaking machine, but actually different uh, layers uh, so that you have not only the color imprinted, but also kind of a bevel and emboss effect. So it's a very, very delicate and intricate way of working where you place the things layer upon layer and then you put them through, I lost the word from akhbesh in English now. Sophia, if you remember the word, please. Uh, uh, the press, you threw it through the press. You. <laughs> so you put them through the press, but because you put also layers of different materials, it gives the paper also the, the imprint of the material and not only the imprint of... Um, of the image itself and you can see it here. This is the clearest I could get it on photo where even though this is printmaking the and even though it's black and white, you get these very, very intricate uh, details of the work and these works were beautiful. I mean, the closer you get, I took for you some of these precious details because you start on the one hand and I'm gonna take you back with these really large scale uh, images, right? They're very, very, very big. The black is very black and the white is very white. But then as you go closer, you really get to enjoy these details. Uh, that are so beautifully taken care of. And you can see it almost looks as if they're layers, but it's not layers. It's just because of how it went through the press. So beautiful, beautiful work um, by this artist. Okay. So we're moving into the next hole and it's actually, again, it's kind of, you, you don't even turn a corner. You go, there's a kind of screen, you go either to the right or to the left of it and you find yourself in this crazy hole. And I must say it's, to me, it was almost unbelievable the size of this. At this point, I was just in the second hole and it feels like I'm seeing enough art like for a year's time. And like, how do I even handle this amount of art? Um, and we're gonna say, a few words about this central work here and about these paintings on the side which we'll see, see in a moment. We have here the artist Gabriel Chaile. Uh, again I'm probably not pronouncing the name uh, correctly. Uh, you can see here the age right so I so I put the ages on purpose kind of because it also gives us an understanding of who's being part of the Biennale. So born in 1985 in Argentina. Um, these beautiful, huge clay structures that when you walk in, you're just like, it's huge. I mean, you can see the sides of the ceiling and I have some photos. This is a professional photo. This is not mine. You'll see my, my photos in a moment. And you can see here, he named each of these sculptures. So the central one is called Rosario Liendro and it's actually after his maternal uh, grandmother. And then the others are named over his parents and his paternal grandparents. So he's giving like these vessels are the names of his ancestry, of his family. And he's taking us through a kind of understanding or world where the people who have brought us into the world, our ancestry, are kind of the vessels where we also come from, but then also we get to look inside, to enjoy, to understand our origins. And it's this uh, crazy size. Um, as you can see here. So you can get the size because you can see the people walking around. So you kind of walk around these larger than life works. And it's pretty also clear to see that they come from the world of pottery, of archaeology, of vessels that we know from kind of ancient worlds, but he's taking them here into the world of creature-like uh, things that aren't for, that bring together uh, past and present. Another beautiful thing, uh, and I took here this image for you, is the way the light shines in uh, 
to these works. So you can see these are openings in the sculpture. So the light shines in. And if, you know, the closer we get, we get to see these, how these vessels hold the light uh, in them. And there's nothing inside other than the light, which I think evokes this beautiful understanding of the relationship to our ancestors, to, to what came before us and how is it functioning in our world today. I must say that um, for me, especially since um, now in LA, Santa Monica, I was spending time with my great aunt. She's 103. And she's an amazing, amazing, beautiful woman, uh, stunning, really. So the feeling of ancestry and and the relationship between generations uh, feels very uh, present for me. And in these sculptures, I think also the clay. Um, I, yeah. And I took some uh, closer photos because something about the combination of the size and yet the way each tiny surface is taken care of with so much beauty and detail. I don't know, look, I must say, this is very strange, but they're making me again tear up. There's something about the combination of size and delicacy that was really stunning uh, about them. It's also one of the things which I'm happy about. I'll just say this, online, and this happens often, we see these beautiful images. It's really a way better image than the ones I could take. It's also without humans in it. But then when you walk through and in between, you actually feel the size of your own body in relationship and you stick your head inside the sculpture, right? <laughs> to get, to get uh, this photo and you get to come very, very close and actually feel the material. And even see here, you can see it's a kind of eye and you get to see this delicacy that each artist brings to these works, which I think is even more impressive when it's uh, at such a size. Okay. Now, I don't know if you feel this, but every time I move from one art piece to the next, it feels like, oh, how do we move on? And that's how it feels when you're walking there. It's like, what, really? The next? Like, what's going on? But yes, it's the next. These are beautiful, extremely lively paintings by, and you can see here, I, I do not know how to pronounce his name. It's him, uh, born in Asma Eritrea and uh, lived and then died again, quite a at a young age in New Haven, USA. And you can see a lot of these artists moved across the world, many of them because of wars. Okay, so uh, he grew up in a, in a, in the ongoing war between Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia. Later, Asmara became the capital of Eritrea. And you can see here these lively, colorful paintings, this one nude with, uh, with bottle tree. And this is one of the things I want to mention about the Biennale that struck me so powerfully, because it's not just about encountering artists from all the world, which, which I never heard about. It's also about encountering so many traditions that I would not know of in any other way. Specifically, there's a tradition in Eritrea uh, to hang bottles on the trees against evil eye. And you walk around and you see these very, very colorful trees and they're colored with uh, all these bottles. So that's where this uh, kind of image uh, uh, comes from with another figure on the side here that is holding various elements from Yorba and other uh, uh, kind of guardian angels and demons from, uh, from his uh, tradition. And I'll just say again, and I'm going back a slide in a mo for a moment, just so you can see, because when you enter this room, you can see these paintings are on the wall and there's something very, I mean, they work very beautifully together, two completely different cultures, but somehow they, they come together in that whole in a beautiful way. Okay, so <laughs> um, hope you're not too overwhelmed and here comes something completely different so we basically we just skipped like three holes and we arrived at this uh time capsule which is one of uh um of five time capsules where the curator Cecilia Alemani decided okay within uh the setting of this uh exhibition she created time capsules that look back into the past and look at the way we tell our story and history 
and bring to the surface maybe people, I'd say mainly women, that we didn't know of or weren't part of the story. Now, this, first of all, I loved for the shape because you go and you see this and you can look from the outside at these windows, the artworks. And then from inside, when you're looking at the artworks, you're also seeing the ones in the hole outside. You'll see in a moment more images so it will become clearer. Uh, the name of this capsule, because each time capsule had uh, a title, is a leaf, a gourd, a shell, a net, a bag, a sling, a snack, a bottle, a pot, a box, a container. I know that's a very long title. It comes from an essay by Ursula K. Le Guin, who's possibly, not possibly, she's my favorite ever science fiction and fantasy author, thinker, world changer. Uh, she passed in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, and yeah, if you haven't heard of her, you're in for a treat because her books are like the best thing on in the world. Um, and she also wrote this um, essay. It's a tiny book. It's an essay that basically talks about the fact that we know history as, uh, you know, when we look at the especially in natural museums or archaeological museums, we always see the first tools as the weapons, right? The swords, the knives, the things that carried meat. But actually, way before that, our society, human society, was based on gathering. And the vessels were the main, uh, the center of collecting. If we didn't have all of these things to contain the food, we wouldn't have had food. And she talks in that essay, which we'll send in the notes because it's short and stunning and beautiful. Um, she talks about how the vessel is actually the initial story and how as women, we, we didn't have that story as part of the human story and kind of bringing it back. And in this uh, time capsule, Cecilia Alemani leans into this, creates a vessel within the Biennale to, to bring forward uh, some beautiful artworks. This is inside. Again, here I'm using the professional photos. You'll get to mine in a moment, but it was so hard to photograph. I was like, okay. So you can see this is the wall outside and this is inside and you're walking between these uh, works of art. And I, choose, I chose just um, a few for you from inside. I must say, I went by the ones that touched my heart like immediately. I was like, uh, you know, on the one hand, there's so much information. And, and then the only way I think to, um, to sift so much information is to listen to the heart, right? The heart and the eyes. It's, it's a great way to like, okay, whatever is stuck in my head can go away. Whatever touches my heart can remain. So that's, that would be maybe my tip for any art viewer. <laughs> Trust your heart. Um, and these are works by Tecla Tofano. You can see her ages and she's from Italy. So these works were here and they really grabbed my attention because they looked like nothing I've seen before. Definitely not from those times. They're from 1975. These are already my photos. You can see them up close. First of all, I must say that what I loved was that to see the front and the back of the sculpture. I needed to go into that oval place to see the front and then outside of it to see the back. And something about that additional uh, effort I needed to make to see the sculpture from all, all sides, I really enjoyed it. And also how you can see from any direction, other works are kind of filing in. Um, this work on the way to liberation from the series, The Female Gender, it's first of all, it's very different from everything that was happening in the world, in Italy and in the world in general at that time, 1975. I mean, we're deep into minimalism. Um, we're not in figurative art anymore. And Tecla Tofano throughout her career just completely disregards uh, what's right, <laughs> what artists are doing then to do her own uh, works. This is in ceramics. And you can see this female figure with a snake coming out of her uterus with the upside down female symbol, kind of holding her head, almost lamentating about the sacrifice of being a mother and also having something very animal-like uh, in, in the way she's created. This is ceramic work. I love this. We're going to see, to me, it resembles something, something we're going to see in one of the paintings in a moment. But it's, it's a human female pregnant figure, but it's also really not. Like it's also animal-like, 
stone-like, shell-like, um, beautiful figure. Here we're going into another uh, section. Again, this is first the professional photo, and in a moment you'll see mine. Uh, this is, uh, no, it's an interesting choice here. It's written in Aleta Jacobs. It's not actually her work. Aleta Jacobs was a Dutch, actually a Jewish uh, woman who was the first female doctor and a pioneering uh, scientist at that time. Uh, really, I mean, and I think to me, one of the fascinating things about this Biennale was how many names that I had no idea of I, I started learning about and how when one woman, this curator, decides to curate an exhibition of that scale and to go back to history and look at the female contribution or the women's contribution to our history, uh, how it shifts, how much comes up that I've never heard of before. So she was a woman and she dealt a lot with creating illustrations and images of uh, the female uh, organs so that they're not as, uh, you know, so they're, they're not a mystery uh, anymore. And you can see here, these are my photos. Uh, you can see how it's displayed, each one. And this is a close-up of one. And these tiny, tiny sculptures, I mean, they're not so tiny. They're like, um, I'd say, uh, uh, ten, great, now I'm like 10 centimeters in diameter. I don't know how much that is in the, the small one. I don't, I'm not sure how much that is in the inches, but someone will pop that into the chat in a moment. Um, these womb models are actually by an atelier who she worked with. So there's another, and these are made of papier-mâché in 1840. It's insane. I saw these and I was like, no, you must be joking. I was going back and forth to look at the years because it, it felt like I'm looking at contemporary sculpture and I'm reading 1840 and I was like, no, 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 this can't be right. And it is right. Who, who knew? So these weren't made by her. Um, but she was working with this atelier based on her illustrations uh, so that she got these out into the world and more and more women could see how our internal uh, organs work and look like. And this is exhibited there as part of that um, time capsule. Then these works, in a moment, we'll see them in a more professional uh, photography settings. Um, I must say, it's also really interesting because when I was there, I was trying to take a photo of everything that excited me. And then looking at the photos back, I was like, oh, I was very excited. I was doing this really, really, <laughs> really, really fast. I was like, uh, yeah. Um, these are works by Bridget Ticano. Uh, and you can see here, started a life in Paris, ended her life in Mexico. Also, these fantastical images uh, in these surreal landscapes, humans with shell that are somewhat, uh, uh, <laughs> I think of bug life when I see them. I mean, they're these gorgeous uh, creatures. Um, and specifically in this one, there's a lot written about this image of having like, female genitalia and this is kind of a closed and this is open with a figure inside. I did want you to see, yeah, this, um, I must say that truthfully, like if we're true to the work, it's, it's, these are more the colors of the work. This image is a little too bright, but it's large enough for you to see. Um, these really fantastic uh, surrealist uh, images of human, uh, human and natural life together. Okay, we just transitioned, skipped a few holes, and found ourselves in another time capsule where I'm going to show you a little less, but just a few. This time capsule was called, I'm just looking at the, ooh, the time, um, uh, seduction of the cyborg, looking more at artists that were dealing with the combination of the human, uh, organic, and the, the uh, industrial uh, form. Uh, and I brought for you specifically this one, Kiss of Rhinoceros by Rebecca Horn, who's an artist that I love. Uh, and this originally has a motor in it where these kind of huge horns come close together, close together, close together almost to kiss, but when, they, when they're when they almost close to each other, there's an electrical kind of vault that pulls them apart. So it's this kind of 
almost a kiss that doesn't happen in a very mechanical form. You can see here the way it's exhibited to me was beautiful just with the building and, and the space. Uh, I'm moving forward just so we also have time for questions and stuff like that. Another work, I'll get to the artist uh, herself in a moment. So there is also painting uh, and a lot of it in the Biennale. And this is huge. I wanted you first to get the scale of the room because you enter and these figures are larger than life. You're standing in front of an oil painting and like you are way smaller than, or I am way smaller than the painting. And the effect of that is very, very uh, powerful. Here we have it much, much closer with the artist Louise Bonnet. Notice uh, also quite relatively young. Um, and uh, she started as a graphic designer, transitioned into uh, painting. And if you see this work is a lot about uh, the excrements, right? So there's uh, on the one hand, there's a very architectural feel to these works, right? It almost looks like marble and stone and the architecture. But then when we start looking, we can see that this fabric might actually blood pouring. It might be urine over here. The nipples are like spraying out milk. So it's a very weird kind of bodily architectural um, image to be staring at. And I must say it was, it's, um, it's a very fun and funky one. It doesn't feel ominous uh, in any way. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show you a couple of videos before I talk about uh, the work we're gonna see. Again, they're very, very short. They're not some amazing professional quality. It's just me taking the video as I'm going around the space. Love to hear herself talk. Talks and talks and talks. Yeah, and there's pictures that go with this. So that's one. And one moment. That's not what I wanted to do. And the other one. So the sound you just heard is the sound in the space. It's not very pleasant. And because of, uh, I maybe I'll take off the sound here just so I can speak. Um, it's it, Venice, in any case, is a Mediter Mediterranean climate. It's hot, it's not well air conditioned, it's humid. And then you enter this space and it's even more like that. And it's actually not very pleasant to be in that space. Uh, we'll talk about the artist in a moment, but I really wanted you to feel and get the sense of the size, right? So each place you're going in, the sizes are just uh, immense. So this is uh, this work. Um, let's just move on up. No. Okay. Um, so the name of the artist, yes, Precious Okoyomon, who's actually there, uh, an artist, a poet, and a chef all together, uh, born in London, lives in uh, New York. Uh, and you can see here the title of the work is to see the earth before the end of the world. This is the ending part of the central exhibition in the Arsenale. So after going through all of this that we've seen now, but imagine doing that for four hours and being absolutely exhausted, uh, you this is the last space before uh, you go out very humid, very intense, and also this feeling uh, that is between like, wow, this is beautiful and green and growing, but with the sound and everything, you get this very, very eerie feeling. And they take the title from a poem by uh, Ed Robertson. So I do want to ask if there's anyone that wants to read, and, and I'll, I'll stop hearing my voice for just a moment. So if there's anyone that wants to read, just raise your hand and we'll un, unmute you. Um, Sophia, if you can help me with this. Uh, I'm Faye. trying to unmute Faye. Faith, are you unmuted? Yes, yes, I'm unmuted. Do you want me to read, Cheryl? Yes, please. Okay. To see the earth before the end of the world. People are grabbing at the chance to see the earth before the end of the world. The world's death piece by piece, each longer than we. Some endings of the world overlap our lived time. 
skidding for generations to the crash scene of species extinction. The five minutes it takes for the plane to fall, the mile ago it takes to stop the train, the small bay to coast the liner into the ground, the line of title to a nation until the land dies, the continent uninhabitable, that very subtlety of time between large and small, media note, people chasing glaciers in retreat up their valleys and the speed. Just Watch. A little more. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Where am I? Uh, I lost it. Uh, speed watched ice. Yeah. Watched ice was speed made invisible. Now it's days and a few feet further away, a subtle collapse of time between large and our small human extinction. If I have a table at this event, mine bears an ice sculpture of whatever loss it is, it lasts as long as ice does until it disappears into its polar white and melts and the ground beneath it into vapor, into air. All that once chased us and we chased to a balance chasing back, tooth for spear, knife for claw, locks us in this grip. We just now see our own lives taken by taking them out, hunting the bear. We hunting the bear, we hunt the glacier with the changes come of that choice. Wow, thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you very, very much. I could never have read it so beautifully. Uh. I really appreciate <laughs> that. Um, I wanted for today, before we open up, we have a few minutes of questions. I wanted I really love that that installation was based on this poem because it helped me ground into it also a little more, especially from far away. I think we sometimes need we sometimes need words to help us grasp what it is. Uh, and if we look at this, uh, the milk of dreams as a whole, really, it's trying to touch on 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 the story of our world in a very very large kind of sense of it, almost too large to grasp. Uh, so before I open up for questions, I will say that what we're going to be doing tomorrow is we'll start looking at some of the national pavilions to understand the politics behind them because they're insane. And we're gonna skip between Russia and Ukraine and the Nordic countries um, and a few others and Dutch and Estonia and figure out how all of these are even related to each other, which is, really crazy. Um, and then we'll dive into the American pavilion and look at what's going on there this year. So that's what's waiting for us uh, tomorrow. Um, and I'll stop sharing. Hello, everyone. Wow, she, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. Wow. <laughs> and we have we have a few minutes uh, for questions. First of all, I wanted to ask among the people in this um, chat, who has visited the Venice Biennale? Because it's quite, uh, maybe you can just write it in the chat because yeah. um, I've actually been there before twice and until I haven't visited it, I just couldn't grasp it. And afterwards, when the people asked me to describe it, I used to say, it's Art Lovers Disneyland. <laughs> yes, it's something between that and the Olympics. You are, like, yeah, exactly. You're on yeah. a chip. But until we get further questions, um, I have a question for you, Shirel. You know, maybe some of our participants um, are well art goers and have seen many exhibitions. But some of us, and maybe also me in the past few years, I'm not so updated in the art world. And many of their names are really not familiar. And it has been like this also in previous years. Um, do you find that uh, intimidating? Do you find that uh, a way, for, uh, a place for us to learn? Um, would you expect more recognizable names for people just to be familiar with what's happening? So that's, it's beautiful to see. And I think it's also very apparent in this year's uh, Biennale and was talked about a lot too, that so many of the names are, 
either new or very old and not necessarily the big names. Actually, some of the bigger names are appearing this year in the collateral events outside of the Giardini and the Arsenale in the city and in my fourth session next week where I'm going to talk about my favorites and highlights. We're going to uh, see some of those works. Um, personally, I found it, uh, I loved it. I love that in this um, really, as you mentioned, Disney world of, uh, of art. Um, and I think it's very powerful. It opened up so much that I didn't know. And I also think that's one of the things that is very relevant to our day and age, because um, so much of our world has opened and shifted. I mean, look at us, we're here online <laughs> uh, together, something that wouldn't have been even, I don't think we would have thought of it two, three years ago. And the distances are shifting and changing. And on the other hand, and this is something the curator Cicelli Alemani spoke about quite a lot, is the need to create a biennial that is very physical. Um, it's not heavily based on video materials, but rather there's something very, very physical about it. And actually the need of physicality of being present with the art, especially after two years of pandemic became very, very pronounced in this uh, biennial. We'll see a little bit more of that tomorrow. Uh, personally, I love it that it's uh, less known and even more so discovering artists from the past that I've never heard of. Uh, and this idea that even now, a 59th iteration of this Biennale, so much can be new even in the way we're looking at the past, past to me is very, very uh, exciting. Uh, there's a good question here by Louise that I, I'll, I'll answer. Um, how are the themes chosen? So basically, once the, once the curator is chosen, she or he uh, are the ones to decide on the themes. So that's a lot of trust in one person uh, that gets to curate this crazy event, but it's really her vision that creates the, the pathway for the Biennale. And each time it's a different um, curator that chooses uh, these, uh, these themes. Um, yeah. I think it, we, we're on on the time. So unless there's like a pressing question. Um, yeah. Janet here is asking if uh, Janet Rosenberg, if you mentioned if there's an event on the Lido Island, do you know anything about that? In previous think, years, there weren't any. When I was there, I don't remember, but maybe this year. I think I'm were. trying to think if the Bruce Nauman one is on that island because I went to a few islands. But as far as I know, no, it's not on the Lido Island. I will check that for tomorrow. So I'll I'll get back to you. Um, yeah, it feels maybe I'll end with, uh, are there still awards? Yes, there are still awards. There are awards for the national, one of the national pavilions, which this year was awarded to the British pavilion. So I'll, I'll have a snapshot of that uh, tomorrow. Um, and there, there's the Golden Lion Award to a, a, a participant. And that this year, this award went to Simone Lee, the American uh, artist. So we're, we're going to dive into her uh, work uh, tomorrow. And the life achievement went to um, Katharina Fritsch, the artist we saw with the elephant uh, at the beginning uh, of this presentation. The awards are given by a jury every year. And yeah, it's really the Biennale is like the Olympics. It's um, the that size of it. I think maybe one of the major differences is the Olympics shift every year uh, or every four years, sorry, to different places. This event, because it's happening in Venice all these years, so many years, uh, it has a very unique feel to it. And we'll talk about it a little more about the national pavilions and what kind of um, stature it give, gives to this event. Um, yeah, so those were the awards and we'll dive into, into the American one more tomorrow and just peep at the British one. There's a lot to see tomorrow. We're going to peep at the Belgian pavilion. We're going to hop to the Nordic pavilion. Uh, we're going to peep into the closed Russian pavilion and understand how that happened. And we're going to learn there's a, a new curious relationship between the Netherlands and Estonia. So things that can happen only in the Venice by 
biannual when you hop from country to country in in a matter of 10 steps uh and we're gonna play with that tomorrow lovely beautiful thank you so much fantastic I'm, so, I'm looking forward to tomorrow so much um you, yeah i'll be gathering a few notes together and hopefully we'll send them out tomorrow morning if you have any further questions of course you're welcome to email us um, and thank you, Shirel, so much for being with us. And thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Bye. <laughs>